Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Professor Helen Sullivan. I'm the Dean of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. A particularly warm welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Rafael Mariano Grossi, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Honourable, Ju Honourable Julie Bishop, our Chancellor, and the Honourable Professor Gareth Evans, and to all our esteemed guests, and of course, John G's family members, his wife and his children, who have joined us this evening for the 2022 John G Memorial Lecture. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and pay my respect to elders past and present. Like you, I am looking forward to hearing from our speaker this evening, so please join me in welcoming the Honourable Julie Bishop, Chancellor of the Australian National University, who will provide some opening remarks and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sullivan, and I too acknowledge and celebrate the fact that we meet on the lands of the Ngambri Ngunnawal people and pay respects to elders past and present. As Chancellor, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Australian National University this evening, Australia's first and only national university that has been for the past 76 years providing first-class research and world-class teaching opportunities to generations of students from around the world and here in Australia. I'm particularly delighted to welcome the G family here this evening, for we are here to honour the life and memory of John G and his wife Liv. Christina, Rebecca and Nicholas are here this evening. I acknowledge the presence of many of the Diplomatic Corps here in Canberra and thank you for your attendance. And of course, I welcome our special guest this evening, Mr. Rafael Mariano Grossi and my predecessor, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans. Mr. Grossi has had a distinguished career as a diplomat for at least 40 years, focusing on the issues of nuclear policy, non-proliferation, disarmament. And he is currently the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. He hails from Argentina, has been an ambassador for Argentina in many roles, um, particularly international organisations based in Vienna. And he's been the president of the Nuclear Suppliers Group, has presided over significant conferences such as the Conference on Conventions on Nuclear Safety, uh, the Conference of Parties to the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, amongst other many important roles. And his work, his insights, his experience have never been more relevant or important as they are today, as the international rules-based order comes under challenge, not just from outliers like North Korea, but also from significant nations, nuclear states that are permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Russia's full-scale military invasion of Ukraine is a direct challenge to that rules-based order, which after all came into being for the purpose of ensuring there was no third global conflict and that more powerful nations could not coerce or use military threats to impose their will on less powerful nations. President Putin uh, doesn't concede that it's a war, he says it's a special operation, but however one defines it, it is the first attempt to redraw the boundaries of Eastern Europe in 75 or more years. The response to the horrendous loss of life and the humanitarian disaster, the devastation of towns and cities in Ukraine has been significant, but NATO has stopped short of 
deploying forces in the defence of Ukraine. And this caution comes from the fact that Russia is a significant nuclear power. It has a massive nuclear stockpile and President Putin has threatened to use it should he perceive that Russia has been under attack. Now, this is unthinkable. This is the kind of issue we had to deal with back in Cold War era of that principle, mutually assured destruction. Mad indeed. The question that is still to be answered is why now? We do know that Russia in fact unofficially invaded Ukraine back in 2014 when Russian military masqueraded as separatists in Ukraine to start an independence movement and there was considerable loss of life in the Ukraine military at that time. And we know because on the 17th of July 2014, Malaysian Airlines MH17, a commercial flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur and then on to Melbourne, was shot down over eastern Ukraine by a Russian book surface-to-air missile that had been deployed into eastern Ukraine and skillfully deployed, tragically, by Russian operators. And 290 people on board, the passengers and crew were all killed, including 38 Australians. I was foreign minister at the time and spent a significant period in Kiev and spoke with the Ukrainian leadership at that time as they grappled with the fact that Russia was present in eastern Ukraine and was seeking to dismantle the Ukrainian government at some point. But we now know that this war will be a long one. The trajectory is escalating. Russia seems to be regrouping after some early disasters. And we also know that there seems to be little room for a negotiated outcome. Where does it end? The sanctions, widespread, significant, are having an impact on the Russian economy. Russia's defaulted on its international loan obligations for the first time in a century. But the impact is global. Rising energy prices, rising food prices, a shortage of food, a shortage of fertiliser, rising inflation. And we know that this can have global consequences. In fact, the UN has warned that there could be catastrophic food shortages in developing nations. We also know, as history's told us, that when you have these kind of shortages, it leads to political and social unrest. In the meantime, there's China, another nuclear state with a seat on the Security Council, siding with Russia. And some of us thought that sovereignty was a red line for China, apparently not when it comes to Ukraine's sovereignty. We've witnessed a much more assertive, one might say aggressive, Chinese foreign policy in recent years under President Xi Jinping. And a number of nations have felt the brunt of that change in stance. There's open competition with the United States in trade issues, and we wonder where the US-China great power competition will end. In fact, it was in September 2018 that United Nations Secretary General Guterres warned of the great fracture when the world was split into two with the two largest economies on earth setting up separate and competing worlds, each with their own dominant currency, each with their own trade and financial rules, each with their own internet and AI capability and their own zero-sum geostrategic and military strategies. So, we know that the rules-based order is under challenge. By that I mean the network, the framework of conventions and treaties and protocols underpinned by international law that has evolved since the Second World War, designed to prevent a further conflict. Where to from here? Well, hopefully our guest speaker tonight will provide some answers. 
and I will now hand over to Professor Gareth Evans to introduce Raphael. Thank you. This is the 14th John G. Lecture in the series which began in 2007 and which I've had the honour of chairing for the 10 years that I preceded Julie as Chancellor of this great university. Reflecting the stature that this lecture has acquired, at least after the inaugural lecture, about which modesty <laughs> inhibits me from making any further comment, it's been delivered by an absolutely stellar cast, a former Prime Minister and Malcolm Fraser, former head of the IAA, uh, Yukio Amano, OPCW head, um, Ahmed Ozumchu, CDBTO head, um, Lasina Zerbo, and by a series of quite outstanding arms control and security experts, both Australian and international. Michael Kelly, Joe Cirincioni, Ramesh Takur, Rod Barton, Tim McCormick, Christopher Hill, Peter Varghese, Scott Sagan, and Hugh White. We couldn't be more honoured and privileged to have this year's John G. De lecture delivered, as you've heard, by the current director of the IAEA, Raphael Mariano Grossi, who, as you've heard from the Chancellor's introduction, is one of the world's most experienced and respected international arms control experts. I've had the pleasure and privilege of knowing Raphael on and off for the last 10 or 15 years or so, and we are very privileged indeed to have the benefit of his presence here tonight. One of the reasons the John G. Lecture, this annual lecture, commands such a stellar cast of speakers is the universal respect that's given to the man whose name its memory honours. Dr. John G. made a quite extraordinary contribution to making the world a safer and saner place. In particular, with the tireless and quite brilliant work he did in bringing to conclusion the Chemical Weapons Convention, and then implementing it in practice through the Office for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. An institutional achievement that was recognised worldwide with the award to the OPCW of the 2013 Nobel Peace Prize. It's one of the many tragedies of John G's early death that he didn't live to enjoy that recognition, which it's absolutely no exaggeration to say would not have occurred without his own remarkable work. I first became aware of um, John's professional work and his stature in the mid-1980s when I was Foreign Minister and he was the Chemical and Biological Weapons Desk Officer in the Disarmament Division of the Foreign Affairs Department. He was responsible almost single-handedly in that role for the establishment of the Australia Group, founded in the wake of the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq War with the objective of denying access by countries of proliferation concern to chemical and biological agents, uh, precursors and dual use equipment. In the mid-1980s again, John started to take a close interest in the long stalled negotiations for Chemical Weapons Convention and working closely with the Defence Science and Technology uh, Organisation scientists Bob Matthews and Shirley Freeman drafted the critical path for the acceleration of those negotiations, focusing particularly on the need to get industry support for an effective verification regime. That effort, with which I became quite closely associated as Foreign Minister after 1988, ultimately bore fruit in the conclusion of the Convention in 1992, which was an international achievement of which I think Australia can remain justly very proud. In 1991, John was appointed by the UN Secretary General to the UN Special Commission, or UNSCOM, which had been set up, you'll remember, to oversee the elimination of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction after the first Iran-Iraq war. In 1993, he was appointed Director of the Verifications Division of the new OPCW, the Office for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, being set up in The Hague under the Chemical Weapons Convention, charged with the complex and very politically sensitive task of developing and implementing all the institutions and procedures that were necessary to verify compliance with the Convention. When the Convention entered into force in 97, John became Deputy Director General for the next six years before returning to Australia in 2003, working at the Office of National Assessments here until he was struck down by the illness to which 
We so tragically lost him in 2007. This lecture was established on the initiative of Bob Matthews of DSTO, then of DSTO, who continues to be its prime organisational mover and is here with us tonight, and Rod Barton. And we're very pleased to have it graced each year by the presence of John's family. As has already been acknowledged, Liv and his wife Liv and his children, Christina, Rebecca and Nicholas. John G was absolutely one of the best and brightest public servants Australia has ever produced. And I'm delighted that we continue to have the opportunity each year to celebrate his memory through this memorial lecture. So please welcome now to the podium our eminent and wonderfully qualified and going to be extremely engaging uh, 2022 John G Memorial Lecture, Raphael Mariano Grossi. Raphael. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, great pleasure, great honor to be here, Julie, um, Madam Chancellor, uh, Minister. Uh, we still remember your uh, several achievements as, as foreign minister of this great nation, and it's a great honor to have met you. Um, Gareth, of course, uh, we go back um, a few years, and I will say something about the negotiations um, and what you personally did to give the world uh, Chemical Weapons Convention. And of course, the G family, um, uh, I actually really did work with John um, for, for quite a while um, in The Hague, uh, where I was uh, chief of staff. And my day started very, very early um, in a meeting uh, known as the Flying Meeting that had been established by John, uh, where you know the, the, the senior staff of the OPCW will, will uh, meet um, every morning around the table, uh, around a table, standing up, and each one of us uh, should say what he or she was doing, and um, he would uh, give us a good direction. Um, but I um, actually met with him before that, when as a young diplomat, um, negotiating the Chemical Weapons Convention benefited enormously and learned enormously for, for this guy, from the um, neighboring, uh, by virtue of the alphabet, Argentina, Australia, um, <laughs> uh, delegation was uh, explaining at the second row, uh, at the second row, um, was explaining uh, to the young uh, third secretary that I was, um, what the hell was going on with the schedules and the chemicals and all of that. And I'm saying this half jokingly, but he had this art of the scientist explaining uh, how to make policy into something workable, which is quite unique, and, and he had it. So uh, an honor, a real honor uh, to, to remember uh, him. And Gareth, to remember, you mentioned um, the, the, the CWC. Um, I still remember one day, this negotiation was long and very, very complicated. Um, we had uh, what we diplomats call a rolling text, so the text that we were trying to negotiate. And for each and every article of this convention, I think we had six versions. Um, with multiple brackets, and square brackets, round brackets, uh, footnotes, etc. It was unreadable. Um, and, uh, until uh, John and, and, and the Australian delegation led by the, by the minister came, and I still remember a day-long session uh, of, the, of the city, I was sitting there somewhere, um, when you explained a path forward uh, you brought uh, a text which was incredibly clean and so attractively looking uh, when Australia, as a, always a voice for moderation, a voice for common sense, uh, put together the elements that you believed could be accepted by all. Of course, it was not that easy, it was not going to be, and people would not ac uh, accept that day that that was the CWC. But I can tell you that that was the moment where we felt we could get out of that maze of, um, of words that uh, did not have any, any, any sense, and then we had the commission. So thank you for that. And, 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 and back to what I'm supposed to do here, which is, to give you an idea of what is going on in the, in the area that the IAEA uh, has a mandate, which is um, essential for international peace and security, basically non-proliferation, but much, uh, much more. 
uh, we are uh, at a moment where by a strange convergence of uh, geopolitical considerations and uh, global phenomena like, like uh, the climate change, the appearance or reappearance of uh, pandemics, um, we are again reminded of the globality of the challenges we have and how we need to work together lest these things uh, lead uh, to a very dark place. Um, Non-proliferation, uh, which is basically trying to avoid that more countries than they do have uh, them uh, now get nuclear weapons, continue to be as challenging as, challenging as uh, it used to be uh, a few years ago. In fact, it was in the around at the time that you were foreign minister, uh, around the, the, the 80s and the 1990s that, that, uh, that um, some countries uh, started to uh, push the envelope and circumvent the norms that they were supposed to be uh, respecting. Um, and this led us, of course, uh, among other things, to the findings after the first Gulf War, when to our collective dismay, we discovered that the non-proliferation regime we so loved was quite limited and was not giving us the real assurances that it should be giving us. In fact, the inspectors of the IAEA were diligently checking that Iraq was complying, of course, with the obligations uh, set by itself in its own declaration. Of course, uh, a few blocks from the place where the inspectors were inspecting that nothing was happening, a full-blown nuclear weapon program was being developed. How about that? Uh, the international community reacted to, to that um, um, in, in, in trying to devise a stronger uh, regime by uh, giving the inspections a wider uh, scope and allowing, when there is uh, a reason to do that, the inspectors to go uh, beyond what a country uh, declares. Um, and this uh, was the beginning of, of, of a new process, which is not fully um, uh, completed, because the additional protocol, which is the instrument that was brought, as the name says, an additional protocol to the safeguards agreement, uh, is not fully universal. But we are walking, um, we are walking in that uh, in that direction. Um, you may see that uh, still uh, we have unresolved uh, cases where we are struggling with the possibility that countries may move from latency to reality. One big collective failure was the DPRK, where up until 2006, um, North Korea did not have nuclear weapons, was approaching them, and a number of uh, initiatives, including the um, an agreed framework that was uh, an incentive sort of uh, deal that would give North Korea um, some things, including um, civilian nuclear reactors, um, in exchange for them dropping their uh, weapons program, failed. Uh, and as a consequence of that, 2006, the first nuclear weapon test to be followed by five more, and uh, everybody seems to be waiting for another one, which could take place any day. In any case, what we see um, is through satellite imagery is that they are preparing for that. We will see when that happens. But in any case, it's a country that not so far away from you uh, is developing uh, a, a considerable uh, nuclear arsenal. Iran is, of course, uh, the bread and butter of what we do uh, in, in, uh, in Vienna. And what a tragedy. It's been so for the last 20 years or so. Uh, because we failed to find a way uh, about it. There have been ups and downs. There have been moments where um, it was believed that uh, an arrangement, a modus vivendi, would be uh, found. Um, um, a good uh, moment um, or a moment of hope came when a, a big agreement, this famous JCPOA, uh, was signed in 2015 by the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, uh, 
but this agreement was uh, abandoned um, unilaterally uh, by the United States in 2018, and Iran, as a retaliation for that, started um, uh, leaving the obligations or not observing anymore any limitation that they have until now, where the JCPOA is nominally, nominally uh, in existence, but it is, uh, uh, it is an empty shell. And now we have conversations, negotiations, trying to revive it. The last um, um, uh, round of that in, in Doha, uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately without decisive uh, progress. We, the IEA, is working very closely, is accompanying this, um, this negotiation because, of course, the role of the agency is to be the guarantor, is to be the one that uh, checks that whatever is agreed on paper actually is uh, respected. But we are not uh, there. Uh, yet. And uh, the issue is extremely important, not only because of um, the uh, Iran's own situation, but um, because uh, other countries uh, in the region uh, are watching closely, and some have even indicated uh, in quite a public way that they would consider themselves um, um, arming, uh, arming themselves nuclearly uh, if uh, uh, Iran was to be seeing approaching nuclear weapons capability. So as we can see, uh, the, the, the specter of nuclear proliferation is uh, still a reality and the, the work of the IEA to try to avoid this situation through international inspections uh, continues to be uh, indispensable. But uh, non-proliferation is not the only, of course, uh, area where, where the work of, of the agency is, is fundamental. Um, we can uh, refer to issues, uh, for example, like nuclear security. Nuclear security is preventing um, people, especially um, non-state uh, actors from getting their hands into nuclear material for uh, hostile purposes. This was an issue that was not uh, paid much attention to um, until um, uh, September 11th, of course, where it became clear information, intelligence coincided in indicating that it was in the thinking of many of these groups to try to get uh, nuclear material either to make a bomb um, or to, uh, uh, to um, disseminate uh, panic through uh, radiation on what is called a dirty bomb. Basically not a nuclear weapon, but a weapon, conventional weapon that has um, uh, in it uh, elements, nuclear material that can cause, uh, of course, radiation uh, and, and, and panic. Uh, with it. Um, uh, presidential summits took uh, place for some uh, years trying to reinforce uh, the norm and the IEA is uh, working um, um, constantly. Uh, hardly any day passes without us getting to know and working with governments uh, trying to avoid smuggling um, of nuclear material. This occurs quite uh, frequently, I wouldn't say almost daily. Uh, uh, although, of course, this is not in the public eye. Nuclear safety, so important. And when I refer to nuclear safety as opposed to nuclear security, what uh, I invite you to think is things like Chernobyl, things like Fukushima, accidents in the operation, in the normal operation of a nuclear uh, power plant. Uh, nuclear safety is at the center of our activities because the IAEA, has normative powers, uh, is the place where you set standards uh, on safety, how nuclear power plants should be uh, operating. And this is fundamental for the viability of uh, nuclear energy as uh, a source uh, of energy. And I'll be uh, saying a couple of words about this uh, in a second. So nuclear safety is so uh, important and it's, um, uh, on, on, on Fukushima, uh, um, uh, perhaps um, a useful segue for what I will be doing uh, when I leave uh, Australia, um, uh, since I will be traveling on to the uh, Pacific, uh, to Suva, uh, since um, 
You may know that uh, Japan, after the accident, uh, accumulated um, important amounts of water which was used to cool down the reactors. This water is there um, and it has to be treated and discharged. And of course, uh, there is a lot of concern, even some groups here in Australia um, and in the islands in particular, which have a very long and heavy history related to nuclear in, in general, writ large, uh, because of the nuclear testing that used to occur in this region, including in this country. Um, so, for the Pacific Islanders, the issue of um, uh, radiological material, the issue of uh, the word nuclear, does not evoke something nice. So, I felt it was my responsibility to come here, to come to them. Never ever has the Director General of the IEA visited them, uh, listen to them. Uh, and my intention by going there is to explain what we are doing with the government of Japan to indicate to them how we are going to be working uh, before, during and after the discharge of water which will be treated to a level that will not contain any um, radioisotope that uh, could alter the environment. But of course there is a lot of skepticism. Uh, about this. Many people, to put it in simple English, don't believe that this is going to be the case. So this is why we have to go, we have to explain, and we have to be held accountable for what we are going to do. Nuclear safety and security, and also nuclear weapons combined in a, in a very unique way in the tragic circumstances that, uh, Julie, you were evoking about Ukraine. I was already in Ukraine twice and I'm trying to return. Um, after the, um, uh, the military operations started on February 24, two things happened. The Russian forces occupied uh, the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, Zaporizhia, where six nuclear reactors uh, operate. And they also occupied Chernobyl, where uh, in spite of the fact that there is no nuclear generation activity, there, there is a big operation led by the IEA to decommission the famous or infamous reactor number four that uh, you know about or saw in the HBO series. Uh, that place is covered uh, under a, a, a big dome and the IEA is working there uh, on the meticulous, painstaking work of uh, taking the, um, the material um, out uh, of there while protecting uh, the, the environment. These places were occupied and, um, and, and with a lot of anxiety in the public opinion, there were announcements about the possibility of uh, contamination of the, um, um, uh, a new Chernobyl, as, as, as some were, were saying it. Uh, we were able to return, uh, do the repair work, establish a good mapping of the radiation uh, situation there, um, and uh, set up a campaign of assistance uh, in that part of the country uh, to re-establish the um, safety uh, of this important uh, um, emblematic uh, site. But we still have the unresolved situation in and around uh, Saporizia. Um, we have the peculiar, unique um, situation there that this place is under the control of the Russian forces, but it's still operated by the nuclear, by the Ukrainian, sorry, uh, operators, thus creating um, uh, a volatile, um, very tense uh, situation uh, which goes against um, common sense and every conceivable principle of uh, nuclear uh, safety. The, uh, the, this uh, nuclear power plant uh, is not being inspected as it should be. It contains roughly 30,000 kilograms of plutonium, 40,000 kilograms of enriched uh, uranium. So we need to go back. Uh, and we are trying uh, to do that. But of course, issues that th for the diplomats around here will be quite um, uh, interesting, like uh, 
the territorial integrity of Ukraine or the, um, uh, the, the possible precedent that uh, inspections under Russian occupation uh, could signify have prevented me uh, from going there. We're still negotiating, we're still trying, and we have definitely uh, to go back uh, to uh, Zaporizhia. But uh, this, um, uh, this uh, fresco of um, problems and, and uh, dilemmas that we have uh, are, are not all. Uh, we are also living in times of what has been rightly uh, been described by the head of the sister organization, the International Energy Agency, not atomic, but energy agency, uh, as uh, uh, the world first energy uh, crisis. Nuclear energy um, is already providing more than 25% of the world clean energy that exists today. Uh, in Europe, half of the clean energy that is produced is of nuclear uh, origin. There is some narrow, I say this um, here in Australia, where there is a debate about the possibility or not of having nuclear energy, but there is uh, some debate in the world about nuclear energy being in the decline. It's just the opposite. We are not, I would say, nuclear lobbyists. Uh, we deal with science and facts. Uh, countries and especially, and of, I would say, special interest for uh, Australia, particularly in Asia, uh, are moving decisively into nuclear, much more nuclear. As we speak, China is building more than 20 uh, reactors. Uh, India is doing the same. Uh, the Philippines has decided, for example, to go for um, or to revive an, an old nuclear power program uh, that they have. And, and this, of course, uh, in Europe, and in particular, again, uh, harking back to this issue of the geopolitical situation, especially Eastern European countries, and you would, of course, um, imagine what's the reason uh, behind this, are decisively moving to more nuclear, since m most of them had it already. But Poland, for example, which didn't have uh, nuclear, is now moving into, in, into nuclear, but Romania, Slovakia, Czechia, um, Hungary um, are all uh, building more nuclear, or Romania, or, uh, or considering it. France, of course, as you, as you have uh, um, heard, perhaps, uh, is um, also multiplying its program. The United Kingdom as well. Belgium, that had decided to phase out, is slowing down because, oh, uh, what's happening with the gas prices and what are we going to do if we turn off uh, nuclear power plants? Uh, the same is happening in, in other places, in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, continue, and, and some others are looking into this. This to say, as, I'm, uh, as I uh, indicated a minute ago, uh, uh, nuclear energy is not the magic wand, nuclear energy is not for all, but it's clearly playing an important role in the current uh, energy uh, crisis. Uh, um, there, there are in, in interesting, very interesting um, new um, uh, vistas um, when it comes to nuclear energy with the introduction of small and modular reactors. Hardly a week passes uh, without me receiving a Minister of Energy from a, de a developed country, in particular African countries, uh, inquiring about small modular reactors. Um, and, and, and trying to see what is necessary. And the agency, of course, is going to try to help them getting the human capacity that they need uh, to, to have those uh, if uh, they can. So, of course, um, uh, this is a matter, as I was saying, that will require extreme uh, safety measures. The IEA is there just for that. As I was saying, we are not uh, in the commercial uh, side of this. We are looking into the conditions that have to be fulfilled uh, for nuclear energy to uh, fulfill this role of uh, helping us uh, decarbonize the global economy, which is, 
the real challenge we have uh, in front in front of us. Um, so nuclear energy and its role in um, uh, in the uh, current uh, energy crisis and the efforts to decarbonize. By the way, um, we are now attending, which would have been unthinkable just a few years ago, the COPS, the Conference of the Parties of the Climate Change uh, Convention. I was there in Glasgow. Uh, and now the organizers of the, of the next one in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, have invited us. So, again, a few years ago, it would have been unthinkable uh, to have the Director General of the IEA addressing um, uh, an environmental uh, event. Times are changing. And uh, perhaps, um, finally, a note on uh, nuclear applications that we are trying to promote. And this is also part of our, minded, of our mandate, one of the noblest, perhaps, uh, when it comes to uh, helping countries in uh, radiotherapy, in nuclear uh, medicine, in uh, oncology. Last March, last February, sorry, uh, in, in Africa, I launched uh, with the president of the African Union, the president of Senegal, Race of Hope, a big project intended to uh, give uh, countries, especially developing countries, capabilities uh, in radiotherapy. In Africa, today, 70% of the population don't have any access to radiotherapy. Um, in Africa, uh, more than uh, 30 countries do not have a single radiotherapy unit. It is a scandal. Uh, people are dying who should not be uh, dying in Africa and in the rest of developing countries. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that I've been discussing uh, with the foreign minister uh, here about the possibility of having Australia helping us uh, in this region also uh, work uh, in this area. So as you see, dear friends, um, the IEA is an organization that does much more than push paper. Uh, it is an organization that is there to control, that there are no weapons to um, help countries that want to decarbonize uh, their economies and to cure uh, when uh, possible. What an honor to be uh, at this in this time uh, at, the, at the helm of this organization. And what a pleasure to be talking about these things here in Australia. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Grossi. Uh, uh, we do have some time for questions. Uh, we have a couple of microphones um, that uh, it would be great if you could wait until a microphone arrives uh, before you start your question. Um, and as is conventional, we would like you to keep your questions short and to end with a question mark. Uh, so <laughs> who would like to begin? Yes, please, here. Um, in the future, do you envisage any new technologies which may enable nuclear safeguards to be done differently or better than they are now? Well, not in the future now. There is a lot of, um, I would say, introduction of uh, technologies that allow us, our inspectors, to do a lot remotely. Um, of course, the nature of the inspection requires uh, physical presence in, in, in many, many cases. Um, you know, uh, um, it is, uh, after all, uh, an investigation in a way, and, and you need the ability of the inspector to, to, to be there. Uh, but there are, um, there are instruments, for example, that allow us to um, ascertain the presence uh, of uh, amounts of radionuclides and, and nuclear material uh, without getting into a fuel element, without getting inside a reactor, which are simply amazing. So yes, uh, there is a lot of evolution uh, in, in that regard. And it is needed because um, if it wasn't the case, we would simply not be able to do the amount of inspection we, we have. The number, I mean, the amounts of nuclear material 
are growing exponentially. And with all these developments I, I mentioned, with the explosion of, of uh, reactors in, in China, in India, in, in, in all these countries, we would have to grow as an international organization apace. And of course, this would never be possible. Even, even if member states would be able to pay for that, it would, we would become a, a huge uh, um, institution and uh, unmanageable. So uh, indeed, uh, we see a lot of progress there and, 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 and it's happening. Yes, yes. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Just there. Thank you. I saw a video of you and COP uh, talking to Gillian Tett from The Economist. It was ah, quite an interview. You saw that? Yeah. It was brilliant. Uh, you handled it so gracefully. So, thank you. Um, firstly, congratulations and, and thank you for that. But on, on a, it illustrated for me the uh, challenges in communication of facts and science within a world of sound bites and, uh, and, yes. and interest. So what yeah. advice would you offer to this audience of you know, professionals and influencers on the realities of, uh, of nuclear energy within, you know, and science-based evidence uh, within the context of the challenges we are now facing? Well, thank, thank you for the question. He, he's referring to something that happened to me in Glasgow. In Glasgow, I was having an open debate in an, in a, you know, in an auditorium, uh, quite big, a bit bigger than this one, uh, and uh, the the Gillian Ted from uh, you know when uh, editor of the Financial Times was was questioning me, and there was a question about about Fukushima, and I said um, that uh, no one, and I would think about what I'm going to say, and, and and if you know it or not, I said of course Fukushima was a big tragedy. No one is banalizing this. It should have never happened. We know why it happened. Um, but I said, uh, talking about narratives, and I said, in Fukushima, nobody died from nuclear radiation. And you know what happened? There was a big laugh. It was a big laugh. Um, there were a few um, environmental activists there, and they were laughing, you know, in a, in a hostile way, in a defiant way. Um, and I told them, don't laugh, what are you laughing about, about the death, about the water? And I explained uh, the reality. I explained uh, the sources for the information I was giving them. Uh, of course, I'm not sure whether I convinced uh, the, some, at least, of these uh, of these people, but it goes to the heart of what you are saying. Uh, the, the the narratives there are very strong. The image of nuclear energy is bad. You can say that the DG of the IAEA said it. Uh, uh, there's the Simpsons. There is yes, yes, the the gooey green thing. Um, uh, and, and this has shaped millions of people's mentalities and approaches uh, on it. Of course, when you have things like Chernobyl or when you have things like Fukushima, then, of course, everything makes sense for, for, for these people. So you have to strike the right balance. For me, it is a never-ending, um, a never-ending uh, job or a never-ending effort uh, that, that we have with our communications team uh, at, at the agency uh, trying to establish uh, the facts. We know that uh, in, in some cases, and this may include, for example, um, some of our friends in the, in the Pacific, they will not believe it. They will think that, that whatever we say um, uh, it's not true, or it's part of a conspiracy, or... Well, in, in front of that, the only thing we, 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 we can do is, as, as, the, as the saying goes, keep cool, keep calm, and continue. Uh, because at the end of the day, policymakers will take the right decisions on the basis of, of the facts. Um, and those who do not, in the end, we see that are in in a minority, and I'm not taking a, 
in this, I say it with a lot of respect and without taking a, you know, a beauty contest approach. Um, after Fukushima, of, of all the countries that decide that we're talking about facing out nuclear energy, there's only one that has really done it seriously. This is Germany. Uh, but uh, apart from that, some said it and they are not actually doing it. Um, or, or putting some footnotes into it so they can delay uh, as much as they can. Right, I mean, it's politics, and uh, we have distinguished politicians here in the, in the room, and there are parliamentary majorities and, and elections to be, to be won or, 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 lo or, lo or lost. So it is one of the most important things. And I think, um, and mea culpa as well, because I believe, and I say this to industrialists, nuclear industrialists uh, often, and also to the IEA itself, there has been, the nuclear world has been opaque, uh, a bit arrogant on the, on the edge, uh, and it has to uh, open and offer itself to, to, to the debate and, and, and you know, confront the, the laughter uh, with, with fact. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes. Thank goodness, a woman asking a question. <laughs> Director General, thank you very much for your tour of the world of the challenge. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm very lucky to work for the Australian Safeguards and Non Liberation Office. Uh -huh. you know well. Yes, I do. Um, <coughs> I wanted to capture or pick up on one issue that you raised an issue of human capacity. Yep. And also evidence based. Mm -hmm. In terms of the uh, initiatives that you've put forward, and I know uh, is a priority for you, in terms of gender equity in the nuclear industry. Can you tell us, um, all of us who are here today, that includes obviously people from the Australian government, but also our foreign representatives, what have you seen works the best in terms of well, encouraging greater gender equity in the nuclear industry? Well, I, I should say, uh, this is one of the most um, important things that we that we have in front of us in terms of uh, the structural um, outlook of the industry and even academia when it comes to let alone nuclear stem the the stati statistics continue to be dismaying and only you know a fraction of uh, nuclear uh, of not nuclear Again, engineers are women uh, every every year, and it is not because there is no uh, female talent uh, out there. There have to be a number, an important number of changes that still need to occur. Um, when I uh, started as director general, the workforce of the IAEA was 28% women and the rest men. I have it at 40 now, and uh, uh, I promised I would get to 50% by 2025, and I told my head of human resources to get ready to have it by 2023. Why? Because it is an issue that has to do not with appointing people because of their gender. It has to do with the way we recruit, it has to do with the way we operate, it has to do also with the opportunities that women have. And this is the other side. One can say for a bureaucrat, it's not that difficult to appoint more women. Although I can tell you, it is. There is a lot of pushback when you try to do that. A lot of pushback, even lawsuits uh, that, 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 that occur. It's amazing, but it happens. Uh, but what we need to do at the same time, is to look at what we are really doing. The area of, you know, gender and gender balance is, is, is an area where there is so much blah, blah. Um, and, and it's very irritating because we, you know, I'm invited to events where people talk about this and what are we really doing? So um, I established something uh, that is, you know, is, it is of relative, if anything, uh, um, impact, but we, we are trying. Uh, we established um, a, a fellowship just for women. It is 
not very original here. It's called the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, but um, it's, a, it's a person that inspires me, a woman that was winning um, uh, Nobel Prizes when, when she was not uh, even able perhaps to sit at the same table than uh, her husband, who was quite a, quite a good guy in the end. Um, when you, when you, yeah, yeah when, you, when you look at Lisa Meitner, uh, an, an Austrian who actually was the, the the one to get nuclear fission. It is Otto Hahn who was working with her and got the best ideas from her that got the prize, not, not, not even invited her uh, to the to the ceremony. So this is why I say um, uh, Pierre Curie was was a better guy. Uh, but still, um, we need we needed to recognize that, um, and uh, we created this fellowship. Um, Australia is also. Uh, helping. Uh, I'm having a hundred fellows per year. Uh, so women that have an opportunity to pursue uh, high degree uh, careers in nuclear uh, are, are joining and I, I'm sure that uh, you would have ideas uh, about that. Uh, so we, we have to continue uh, in this effort reaching out. I'm working a lot with women in nuclear Women in Nuclear Global and the, the chapters of uh, Women in Nuclear uh, nationally. But this is a problem that goes beyond, as we know, goes beyond, um, and I've seen it. I'm a father of a good number of young women, seven. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, say, I, I say it because, you know, they are in the professional world, and I've seen firsthand the problems that they that they met, going to, to school, then going to college, then joining the workforce. So um, the, the, the task is, is huge, but I, th I think that we, we, are, we are in the right direction, not at the speed uh, I would love and I would like, but uh, moving in the right direction. And by the way, women make the best inspectors. <laughs> Oh, well, Mr. Gorsi, thank you so much for that uh, uh, tour de force of policy making, governance, politics versus, uh, um, well, everything really, and, um, and of course, gender. Um, I think this has been an absolutely fitting tribute to, to John G and, uh, and his own excellence. Um, and we really, really appreciate you coming and uh, both sharing your wisdom with us, but also participating so generously in the questions. Um, there are refreshments outside for those of you who are able to stay. Um, but before we get to that, please join me again in thanking Director General Gill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.